the last two lectures I kind of uh, told the stories, wrote you know things on the board, but not very very precise statements. So now since I'm in, I'm, I'm coming to something a little more uh, structured here, I, I will use slides, but uh, I will try to keep it l as lively as a talk without slides. Of course, it's harder, so stop me if you're tired of formulae. Um, so I will start by, by uh, so. Yeah, so let, let me fix, I mean, th these are the notations we already have. And I will start by giving you again the notation about stochastic gradient descent, and then very briefly summarize what I explained last time about the um, single index thing, and then go to the new thing on the summary statistics. So remember what we're trying to do. We have an unknown probability distribution P. That's the basic pro problem of statistics. Let's say on RD, or an open set on RD. And then we have a loss function. So we're already at the stage where the statistical thing is done. We have a loss function. L, which is defined on uh, oh, here. Ooh, ooh. OK, easier. Here, on V cross U. And uh, so V is the parameter space. So the loss function is the function of the parameter and the data. And, and of course, the goal is to find the minimum of the population loss, which I called phi. So the population loss means the expectation, x is the value of the parameter, the expectation of the loss function on the data with this unknown probability distribution with a given parameter. You've built the statistics procedure, the machine learning thing, whatever, is to build a loss function, phi, such that the point where this function is minimum gives you a good estimation of the parameter you're trying to find. Okay? And you're completely free, in fact, to choose this L, as long as this is satisfied. So you want two things. You want that the, the minimizer of phi be close to what you want to, to the parameter you want to estimate. And you also want the, this uh, optimization problem to be simple, right? Otherwise, it's not easy. So, of course, we don't know the true population, so we cannot really compute phi, usually. Okay? Of course, in all the academic examples I'm giving, phi is there so that we, can, we know it, but in, in the abstract, we don't know it. So we cannot simply minimize phi. If I were asking this, you would say simply, let's, let's do a gradient flow on phi, and that's it. But you don't have phi, right? So what do you have? Uh, what you have, instead of having the population loss, you have, the, you, have a you have data. So you have a task, which is to find this parameter and data, uh, y1, ym, iid sample, of the distribution P. That's your data. So what you could do, of course, and that's what we've discussed already, and that I use this notation, you could look at the empirical loss. The empirical loss, LM hat, hat as always in statistics means empirical. M is to remember the size of the sample. It's just the mean of the loss on your data points. Right? So this one is accessible. You have it because you have the data. Okay? And of course, the law of large number tells you that if m is very large, this should be close to phi, to the population loss. Right? But the question here, remember that we are in a situation where the dimension, both of the parameter and the data, may be super large, and m not necessarily that large. So let's see what happens. So. The classical regime, of course, when D and P, the dimension of the data space and the parameter space, are fixed, and M, the size of the data sample, goes to infinity, then, uh, then naturally, one thing you could do to find the minimizer of the population loss is to follow a gradient descent for the empirical loss, which would be an algorithm like this. Right? At time L, you just look at the place where you were at time L minus 1, minus the gradient of the empirical loss there, multiplied by some step size de delta. Okay, and you start from somewhere. So in this classical regime where M is large enough compared to D and P, then this, um, the empirical loss should be close enough to the population loss for this gradient descent to find, to find an approximation, a good approximation of the minimum of phi. Right? 
So that's the classical regime. I, so remember, so that's the that's the uh, that's the gradient descent for the empirical loss. It's simply this. So I write here explicitly what this LM hat is. Okay, the gradient of LM hat is just this. So what you do is that every time step you use the whole data set. Okay, and you take the, that's the whole batch if you want of data, and you take the, the average of the gradient and all these data points, and then you follow that. Okay. Of course, you could do something else. You could try a discrete Langevin dynamics, you could, which means to this you could add some noise, right? You just don't want to follow the. The, the gradient, you could add some noise to avoid traps, whatever that means. And in the different examples I've already mentioned, all these different variants have been studied. And they all do the same thing. Anyway, so... But what you could also try is stochastic gradient descent, which is really the, the go-to method for, for those large-scale optimization problems. And I mentioned it yesterday. So it comes in many, many variants with different mini-batches, different learning rate, reuses, all sorts of things. So here I define the simplest case, which will be online SGD. So it starts the same. But here, So look at the difference. Here you just use one data point, right, rather than the full batch. Okay. So uh, that's why it's called online. I give you one data point, you use it immediately. I give you this data point, you use it immediately to do a step in your online algorithm. You could do something in between. I mentioned that yesterday. You could use, so this is a full batch, which means you're using all the data from 1 to m. Here, this is the absolute smallest batch you can do. You're using one data point. And of course, you could use seven, five data points, right? So, so a batch of size k would be, you would do this, this thing, but instead of taking m to be the full data, you would take m to be k, whatever, between 1 and m. That's called a mini batch, yes? Uh, do we know how to calculate the optimal batch for a problem? You don't even know what an optimal batch is. That's exactly the, one of the questions. So here, so there, there is kind of wisdom about all sorts of things, but I'm sure that in, given any statement of this wisdom, I can find a counterexample. But the, so here, what I'm saying is that in practice, what people do in serious hard large scale optimization problems, they use small mini batches. And in fact, here we could prove our results with small mini batches. So, in order to not overburden the statements, we do just that with the smallest possible batch, which is one. Okay, so that's what I'm saying here. You can have, you can choose the size of the mini batch. You can lose the learning rate, which is essentially the, the size of this constant delta. The reuse thing is something else. If you want to know what that is, that's fun. So it has been done for the very simple examples we're mentioning here. It has been done very recently by. Uh, Florent Jacala and Lenkesh de Borova and their team in Lausanne. That's a very natural problem. The, the one way to do it is if you, let's say you do online SGD. So if you have M data points, you can do M steps, right? Because you use one data point at every step. But if you don't like the result at the, at the end of this and you want to continue your optimization, what do you do? You can reuse your data. You can continue using your data, but how would you do that? So that's reuse. So you have a million ways to reuse your data. You could reuse it in the same order, right? Or you could, for instance, randomly permute them, use a random permutation, and now use this new version. So you see, it's a whole zoo of things that you can do, okay? What? So, so reuse, of course, is, 
is a very important thing because, and I won't have time, I could, but I won't have time to explain all that, but it's very important because this allows you to do better, possibly, with the same amount of data. What is expensive is data. You, don't, you cannot simply say, let's multiply m by 10 to the, to the 3, right? But reusing, if it does something good, is a good idea. Okay, so for the moment, I will not look at large batch or whatever. So I will just tell the results we have for, as I explained last time, give the same thing for this and for that. So you can imagine that for batches in between, it would be, this is batch of size one, this is batch of size, of full size. So in between, it would also be the same. But it doesn't mean that for other problems, this would be the case. So that's the, uh, that's the online SGD. And of course, you have to give uh, uh, the initialization. And yesterday, we discussed a bit the initialization, mu. Typically, you want to have a, a, a random initialization because you don't know anything. Right? But sometimes you have what I, what I call a hot start. You have, you know, a little bit. So you start from something which is maybe not that bad. Okay, instead of just completely random. What you don't want to do in statistics is what computer scientists will do, will want, want to control, which is, or mathematicians, which is to, con to start from the worst possible thing. You don't want your system to fail, right? So you, the only thing you have to beat here is the fact that you don't know anything. So you start randomly, okay? So of course, what you want to understand is the evolution here in the regime where both the dimension of the parameter space and the dimension of the data space are large, but m is not too large, the sum of the sample, the size of the sample. That's what I discussed yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Okay, so I'll be very quick because I already mentioned this uh, history. So a little bit of history about the stochastic gradient descent started, as I said, in Robin Monroe, Robin's Monroe 51. And the important thing, so, I mean, it's a long, long story, but what, as I explained last, last time, in the classical line of work where you have enough data, where D and P are not too large, but M is very large, then what you prove, all these theorems prove in all sorts of variants of SGD is that essentially the flow of the, uh, the trajectory of the SGD, as I explained yesterday, converges to, the, to what you want, to the gradient flow of the population loss. Okay? So SGD is a, is a cool way, economical way, to, to access the gradient flow of the population loss, even though you don't know the population loss. Okay? But that's in the, in the classical regime. So you have this pathwise limit theorems, you have functional central limit theorems, you have large deviation principle. And yes, yesterday I mentioned this, uh, this class, I, uh, this course I like by Michel Benaim, which is already 25 years old. Um, all right, so that's the classical story. And is it proved? Yeah, yeah, all that. In, I don't want to give you a million theorems, but in the classical situation, this is, you, you have not only the convergence, but you have fluctuations, you have large deviation. It's under control. It's a long story, but it's essentially under control. And the only thing you have to remember is that the intuition that this thing is close to the flow of the, of the population loss is correct. Okay. So, of course, now we are looking at high dimensional things. And which, another way to say that is uh, you have large P and D or you have small M, right, which is the same thing. So, you cannot simply, so in this case, of course, in particular, of course, in the classical regime, what you, you, nothing prevents you from having a delta to be pretty small because you have many, many, many data. So, here, remember, if you take your data very small, you move very little. A lot of pro studies on SGD in high dimension today are, in fact, very close to initialization, right? where, where you essentially don't move. But that's not what you're really interested in. So here you cannot take, in general, the learning rate to be arbitrarily small, because then you would have to have a very large sample size. So this is a common issue. If you want a good survey of this type of question uh, on a much larger type of thing than SGD, you, this, this work by Vershini and Wainwright is nice. Okay, so here, now there are many more or less classical limits. Of course, you have the, what is called the mean field regime by my friend and colleague van den Eyden, Eric van den Eyden and his student, by Andrea Montanari and his collaborator by, in France, by, by uh, Francis Bach, Shiza, and, 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 and etc. And for what I'm describing here, 
For non-convex SGD, this goes back to Lequin. Botou is, of course, Léon Botou is, in fact, essentially the, 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 the person collaborating with Jan for, for decades now in, at Facebook now for, and he's the one who is the more theoretical on the optimization side. And of course, the, this recent work I'm trying to explain now, and I give you many other references, and there are many, many more. Okay. And of course, there's also the, the enormous amount of work that is done in Lausanne today at EPFL by uh, Florent Lenka and their collaborators. Okay. Let me skip that. Let's go back to what I was explaining. So this, now you have the notation, you're what, what we want to do. Let's go back to what I was explaining yesterday. So yesterday I, I gave you the single index type of model. So let's look at what it is. So here you have a sample again. You have your loss function or oh, the population loss. Uh, okay, it was called phi, I'm sorry. Now the phi has changed. But So we assume that the loss function, the true loss, the, the, the population loss, is in fact a function of a one-dimensional thing. That's single index. That's what I assumed yesterday. And this one would be the inner product of x with some given vector, x star. Okay? That's what we had yesterday in tensor PCA. So the population loss is a function of a one-dimensional object. Right? That's the single index or rank one problem. So this covers many important problems. The one, the one that I mentioned yesterday, spike tensors or spiked matrices, tensor PCA, generalized linear models, phase retrieval, supervised learning for a single layer. I'll come back to this example. Two mixtures of two Gaussian, not three. Right? If you have three, then of course it's not rank one. If you have two, of course, you have two bumps here. The rank one is just this distance here between them. So I, I, I won't spend time to explain all these statistical problems, but it's already a bunch of reasonable, still a little academic, but reasonable, important problems. Okay. So here I will, so the context, again, we can study the topological complexity of the landscape or the dynamics of optimization. So I will stick to point two, that is the dynamics. The complexity for this type of thing, for instance, I, I, I will not mention, but there is a, a joint work which is two or three, two years old with Antoine Maillard and Giulio Biroli from Ecole Normale, where we, we do that. In terms, so again, you use the Katz Rice formula, you have a complicated random matrix, much harder than in the tensor PCA case in general. And, and you, you find again that the model is exponentially complex. And when the signal is strong enough, it becomes less complex. So that was the main story I told you yesterday about PCA. But I don't want to spend time on that because I want to go to dynamics. So I will describe here the results on online stochastic gradient descent, which I call OGD, which we have had on this, in this case, but with, of course, uh, Jagannath and Reza Gaysami, which started the story. So let's go. So again, that's the story, except here uh, there's a tiny difference. So this is, the, the, oh, this K is T, I'm sorry. Um, so that's exactly the algorithm I'm giving you here, except that I'm on the sphere. So here, even if I take the gradient, the gradient, of course, is the spherical gradient here. But then I have to, this x tilde is not necessarily on the sphere. Right? So I project it back on the sphere by just normalizing it. Okay? If, uh, if you don't like this, at some point I will come back to things in Rd and not fix the radius, let the radius move a bit. But that, that's, that's, that's not very important. And of course, you start with an initial distribution, let's say mu. Okay, so what do we know? What I told you yesterday is, so of course, the, the, the important thing, so this is the population, this is the loss, and this is the mean of that. I'm sorry for this change of notation. This is the expectation of that. That's the population loss. I call H, if you want, H is the centered loss, right? You understand? This is the expectation of that. So H is just the loss centered. And so we'll need the, this notation. And so we prove that 
online stochastic gradient descent, I call OGD, recovers the signal, at least partially, so it does better than random. In time t, which depends on, uh, of order m, right? Because remember, the number of steps I can do here is m, right? If I choose well, alpha, which is m over n, that is, of course, depending on the amount of data I have, and delta, which is the step size. Oh, by the way, here, my notations are also shifting. N is also D, that's the dimension of the data, or, or the dimension of the parameter, whatever, we'll see. Okay, so here, let me explain that. So, of course, the right choice of this alpha and delta will depend on the problem and on what I called the information exponent. So let me, I, I explained that yesterday. So let me explain what the information exponent is. Remember that we have this structural assumption. My population loss is a rank one thing. It depends only of the function of a one-dimensional thing, the latitude. Remember, m of x is just, if x star is my north pole, m of x is just the latitude. And the information exponent is the number of vanishing derivative at zero. So that's, that's what it is. So, or uh, plus one. So now, here is, here is the result that I mentioned a little more vaguely yesterday. So you have to choose your, your step size between alpha minus 1 and alpha minus 1 half, right? And our classification gives the following. When the information exponent is 1, the only thing you need is this alpha to be much larger than 1, so m to be much larger than n to guarantee that the latitude after m equal alpha n steps converges to 1, right? To converges to the top, to the North Pole. Okay, so you recover the signal fully as soon as you have that much. This tells you how much data you need, right? You need m to be much larger than n, right? So to be n if you want, a little bit, a little bigger. When, so that's what I call the simple model. That's when the information exponent is 1. When the information exponent is 2, then you need a little more data. You need log n square rather than 1. Right? You need alpha to be much larger than log n square. So m has to be lo much larger than n log n square for the same guarantee. And again, it's because it's harder to escape the equator. Remember, you project on the latitude, and you have this differential equation with vanishing derivatives at zero, so it's hard to escape zero. When you start from a point which is close to zero, because you started from a point at random. And the hard models, it's when k is strictly larger than two. So for instance, tensor PCA was in this class, because this k was exactly the p of the tensor. And then you need this. You need larger than n to the k minus two for the same guarantee. Okay, so in the critical case, it's a log. Number of derivatives around the equator. I mean, non-zero. Yeah, at zero, your 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 function. Remember the loss function. Yeah. What I called phi. Okay, I, I changed the notation. Phi of x is a certain function, uh, not f u, but whatever. Psi of m of x, which was the latitude. That's the North Pole. And you count, so you have psi j of 0 equals 0 for all j less or equal to what I call k minus uh, whatever, minus 1. Right, so k equal 1 means the first derivative is non-zero. And then, of course, psi, psi k non zero. Okay, so you you look at the first time your derivative is non zero. Okay. So tensor PCA the K was P. Okay. In the various example I gave you, they were the K were just all the ones that are in fact used in practice. Of course, never fall in the case where K is larger than two. In practice, if you phase retrieval is k equal two, right? So critical is still acceptable, right? That's easy. That's acceptable. Nobody wants to do that, 
because this asks for much more data than you want to do. Right? If your n is 10 to the 9 again, and k is 5, you have 10 to the 9 to the power 3, that's a lot of data. Right? Remember, this is the guarantee that your system will work in short-ish time, in linear time here. Right? That's the important thing. So, okay. So that's what we mentioned yesterday, but there, that was the positive results. You also have the negative results, which are refutation results. So the OGD fails after m steps, meaning it stays at the equator. When, in the easy case, when k1, if alpha is much less than 1, so you, if you have much less data, that, if you have less data than dimension. In the case equal 2, if m is smaller than log n times n. Remember that it works when you had log n square. So we have a little hole here, right? We have a little gap between the refutation and the, the negative and the positive result. That's just because we are, I'm sure this can be fixed. But, uh, and here, again, it's when it's much smaller than n to the k minus 2, it doesn't work. So essentially, I give you complete results. Either it works or it doesn't work. A little region where it's a little blurry. Uh, and so when you have k strictly larger than 2, you just, it just doesn't work. Right? If you start from a random start, it won't work. Okay, so here is one example. So you take the uh, supervised learning task with an L2 loss for single layer networks. That means this. So what is a... a What am I? So single layer means I have just that. So here you have dimension n or whatever. That, that's the size of my uh, of this layer. You have a vector x of dimension n coming here. A is here. All these arrows are have a weight a one to n. And so A is also a vector, if you want. Then you take A uh, inner product with X. This gives you this value. Right? Remember my, which means here you have X1, A1, plus X2, A2, etc. That's what it means. This gives you a value here, which is A inner product with X. And then you apply an activation function, a nonlinear thing. Right? So, and then you just take the L2 loss, which means this is the output of your network. This is the truth, right? X star is the thing you want to estimate and you don't know, right? So you, look the L, you take the L2 loss, you take the expectation of the square of this. Of course, the minimizer of this phi is naturally X star. So this thing, if you can find the minimizer of phi, you find x star, which is your goal. Right? You're trying to find x star. Okay? And that essentially, you know, the, uh, of course, you don't know phi again because you don't know the distribution of x. So you cannot do this expectation right, in practice. So that's why you do this empirical gradient or the online SGD. So if you do the online SGD now, so how for this very simple structure, how do you compute the, so this is obviously a function of, uh, so how do you compute the, um, the, acti the, the information exponent? Then k equal 1, that's the easy regime where you escape the equator easily, k equal 2, that's the critical, and k equal 3, the, or larger, the, the hard regime. For instance, if you change the, the activation function, things change. If you take the sigmoid for, the acti for sigma, right, so what is the sigmoid you will remember, I guess? The very often used activation. That's the sigmoid. The relu. So you can all draw the graph. Of course, the sigmoid does that. The relu is... Of course, simply as I explain, x plus, which is not exactly smooth. I assume x to be sigma to be smooth, but you can smooth it a bit to put it in the theorem. When you take 
sigmoid or relu, this is an easy problem. Okay, k equal 1. If you take sigma of u is u square, or absolute value of u, this is the phase retrieval. Sigma of u square is the phase retrieval. I don't tell you what the phase retrieval is, but it's a very important problem. And there you are critical. But now if you're a little crazy and you want to have a hard regime, so if you take sigma of u equal u cube, right? In fact, it's easy. But if you take sigma of cube equal u cube minus 3u, it's hard. Okay? So why? So the real result behind this, which I, I don't want to give all the theorems, but I explain, this depends on the decomposition of your sigma in Hermit polynomials. That's it. So the K, so you decompose your sigma in Hermit polynomials, and you look at the first component in the basis of Hermit polynomials, which is non-zero. Right? And this explains all that. So this is because your expectation is Gaussian or uh... Yeah, 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 of course I forgot to say that. The the the, the expectation is Gaussian, yeah. Just, I think there's one thing, and I'm a little bit confused. Uh, I thought usually uh, the A is what you're looking for, no? Yeah. And uh, there it seems that you move along the Oh, X. I'm sorry, I inverted, yeah. X is the parameter and A is here. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> but since they are the same dimension, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. A is the parameter and A is the, the, the X is the parameter and A is the data. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. S thanks for that. Okay, so if you take here, whatever sigma, which is, a, let's say, a Hermit polynomial of degree k, larger than 2, then you would find a k larger or equal to 3. Okay, so I just give you an example to show that this thing is very, so this initial phase, the search phase, when you want to be a, a little, do a little better than random, this depends very much on your engineering skills. And of course, in your problem, how you choose this sigma, right? But there is something else that comes out of all our papers, which is the following. Once you've escaped mediocrity, once you've escaped the equator, when the search phase is over, you found one of those informative regions, then the activation function is not as important. Then everything just, whatever you choose goes as fast. So the last phase is very simple. Okay, so the, the, the choice of your architecture here, the loss, the, the, the activation function, is important in this first phase. Okay. So that was the, so this one uh, rank one single index case. One thing I didn't tell you, but of course I could, is that if you follow the trajectory of optimization, and for instance, you follow along the trajectory, you follow the Hessian, then of course you will see a BBP transition. Once you escape, you will see a rank one BBP thing. Right? One eigenvalue will escape out of the bulk of your Hessian. Okay, so now that was the story up to now. Okay, took an hour to do that, but uh, half an hour to do that. Now I want to go to why do we, why would we stop with index one, right? Here I assume that the simple thing was rank one, right? The so, so when do you see it uh, escaping from the, I mean, for, for, okay, originally the session is completely random. So what, uh, uh, after which uh, time do, do you see the, the... So that's what I told you, in fact, after M, because I do only M steps, okay, but remember see. that this M is alpha N. So depending on, and I gave you the regime, the, depending on whether k is 1 or 2 or more, this alpha is, has, has to be larger than 1 or larger than log n squared or larger than n to the power p mi k minus 2 over 2, right? So it takes time for this uh, escaping. So for instance, when you are in a, in a hard regime, it takes n to the k minus 2 over 2 times n steps. Mm. Yeah, because you need after the, the next yeah. one to reach. Yeah. Thing, so. so it's uh, whereas when it's when it's uh, alpha is one, you need essentially n steps, mm. right? Okay. A large constant times n. Okay. 
But the, the first level is just to exit. It's just to exit. The, the end thing is very far, fast. Okay? And in fact, so this first phase, which I call the search, but not only one, but me, everybody calls it the search phase, you, 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 you get to the, uh, the second phase when, in fact, your uh, spectral transition is, is, is achieved. All right, so now let's go to a situation where instead of having one uh, uh, rank one uh, information, you have maybe more. Okay, so that's what I explained last time. We imagine that we, we want to think that for every system that, is, that has been well engineered, the, the action is not in dimension n, which is 10 to the whatever, but in fact in a finite dimensional thing. But this finite dimensional structure is not always obvious to find, right? In this rank one thing, even that is not obvious to find. Of course, if you know the, the, the population loss and it's a function of the latitude, right? Cool, then you, you know what, what thing you want to follow. You want to follow the latitude. But if I don't tell you that, how do you find the latitude? Because of course you don't know x star, so you cannot compute the latitude, right? So that's a, that will be the difficult problem. But for the moment, let's act as mathematician trained by, by, uh, by Bourbaki. We just want to uh, set up uh, 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 settings in which we have a finite dimensional projection that are autonomous, like we had here, or almost autonomous. So the first question, if you have, a, imagine you have your SGD, which is this system, and you are, you are in fact in a very high dimension, in dimension n, which goes to infinity. How do you state the limit theorem? Right? Before I told you that when the dimension was fixed, you proved that the flow, the trajectory of this thing, converges to the flow of the, the gradient flow of the population loss. But here, what does that mean? Your trajectory is in a dimension that diverges. How do you state the limit theorem? Right? As probabilists, we're used of limit theorem for path, but for path in finite dimension. If we have a path which is not in finite dimension, what do we do? Maybe we have a mean field limit, so we take some average, right? But otherwise, or we take the empirical measure, something like that. But here there's no reason to assume, and it's absolutely not true, that, the, that we are in an exchangeable situation. When, for those who understand mean field limits, the basic thing is that your variable should be exchangeable. The fact that you've called this variable, this electron number one and this one electron uh, number 17, makes no difference. You could just permute their, their labels and this would not make a difference to the system. Here it's absolutely not true. The different neurons could very well play a different role. So you can't always do a, a mean field type thing. So you don't even know how to state the limit theorem. Right? And we would love to have a limit theorem. Okay, so that's the first question. How do you state the limit theorem? But in fact, what, I, what I'm saying here is that you don't need to follow the full parameter, but only a few, di a few dimensional, finite dimensional function of it, a projection, right? So your xt is a very high dimensional thing. Here I call it p, sometimes I call it n. And so when this p or this n goes to infinity, what does it mean to have a limit? But if you project in dimension 17, then you could say maybe the, the projection has a limit, right? So the question here is, do, can we imagine having autonomous evolution for finite dimensional projection? And of course, they cannot be really autonomous. They will be almost autonomous. If you have, you want to look, have a projection in dimension 17 to be autonomous, and you still have 10 to the 9 minus 17 directions, it cannot be completely autonomous, but maybe almost autonomous, right? And, and these projections, when they work, it's not true for any projection, of course. We will call them summary statistics. So what we'll do now is introduce the axiomatics of that. When is it that something gives you a, a good projection, right? Of course, the real question is, how do you find these summary statistics when they exist? So you could have a utilitarian point of view. What I want is at least the, the summary statistics, the summary of the system contains at least the loss because I want to minimize the loss. Maybe the distance or correlation between the, the, the position, the X I have and the ground truth, right? So the quality of my 
approximation, maybe the amplitude of certain weights because I know that they're important, maybe some natural parameters in the population loss function. Like we, so what does this sentence mean? Let's take again the single index thing we had before. The population loss was a function of one parameter. So it's natural, that's a natural parameter to follow is this one parameter. If the population loss is a function of 17 parameters, maybe it's natural to follow those 17 parameters and to cross your fingers and hope that they are summary, right? that the dynamics is autonomous. Or maybe they could be given to you, as, as we will see in, uh, Friday, by a spectral transition. That's not tomorrow. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is a mistake <laughs> on Friday. Um, all right. So what I'm going to say now is based on this joint work with Reza and Okosh. And you have a short version, if you're just interested in the short version in NeurIPS and a long version in CPAM. Yeah? yeah sorry, just to, uh, maybe I haven't understood. So if you take an image, for example, yeah. So here, you, you say, in the case of an image, you say that typically you have, a, say, a wavelength basis, or you have a basis. It could be that. And then you have, like, you can shrink your coefficients and only follow uh, small amounts. Yeah, but the question is, it's not true that whatever subfamily will be autonomous, will no. be summary. The question is, so for the moment, I w what I'll do here is, let's assume that, th that we are super inspired and we know something that will be autonomous. What can we do with it? And you will see, you can, there is, there's not only one family. This, this projection can change. And even spatially, if I look here, I have a certain projection in the space. If I look here, I have another projection, right? So then the question will, practically, the question comes of how do you choose the projection? This is, I'm already hinting at the real difficulty. But for the moment, I'm doing simple thing. I'm doing math, right? Which is, Let's try to understand what would create autonomous projections. Okay, so, so if you want to read, you have that. I, I write this because I'm a little vain here, but I'm so happy as a mathematician to have a best paper award in, uh, in this type of thing, you know, where normally we are considered as absolutely non-serious. Uh, because we don't, I, I cannot code anything, but here. So let me give you a formal definition of summary statistics. So, no, I, I'll tell you what we'll do. So I will first introduce a formal definition. Then I will pro proceed to prove that under condition, the evolution of these summary statistics is autonomous. They converge as the dimension grows to a solution of a system of differential equation. Where, and these limiting things we call effective dynamics. So in dimension 17, this limiting differential equation sometimes can be stochastic. We'll see when. And these effective dynamics are, depend very much on where I start. They depend very much on the parameter region, where I am in the parameter space. And of course, also on the scaling of the step size with the dimension, the delta. Right? So all the natural things when you do optimization. The delta, where you are, if you are in a hot or cold or whatever region. and um, so we'll look at that. So that's what I'm going to say. And before even I, before I introduce all this uh, uh, explicitly, let me give you the conclusions, what we can do with this. Because at this point, you know, when you have summary statistics and effective dynamics, what do you do? So typically, in all the examples we've seen, then you have two types of phase. So you have what we call ballistic phases, where the summary statistics essentially uh, are solutions of ODE, they, they change microscopically, and diffusive phases close to points where you don't move fast, where they fluctuate microscopically. Right? So again, remember this projection in dimension one, tensor PCA, when you are near zero, you don't move fast. Right? And then at some point when you get away from this sticky region, then you move fast. Okay, so you have the second phase is ballistic. In the example of tensor PCA that I gave you, or the, 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 or the general uh, example I gave you uh, of rank one thing, single index, the, the diffusive phase is, is at the beginning. And then you have a ballistic phase. So that's the usual thing, but 
everything can happen. So during training, when you during this evolution, the evolution can start with ballistic or diffusive. In the example I gave you, it started with diffusive. And then you can even alternate between these things. You can be fast and then slow and then fast again. So things are complicated. So, and so our approach allows to develop scaling limits for all, all these types of phase. So why is that? The system we had with rank one was very simple. We had only one region that was bad, that was the equator. Once you escaped it, you were out of the woods. But in general, when we will project in dimension 17, you could very well start in something which is slow, and you have now a dynamical, let's say, forget 17, so that I can draw a map. If you have dimension two, you can draw, start in a bad region, which is slow, then you get out of it, move with your dynamical system to another slow region, okay? And then where, of which you might escape and go, and then in the end, find the region where you want to go, which is where the minimum is, okay? So all, the, all sorts of things can happen. I will describe that. So in the ballistic phases, the effective dynamics are given by an ODE. And usually the finite dimensional intuition, the classical intuition that the summary statistics evolve under something like the gradient flow for the population loss is correct. When the learning rate is su sufficiently small. When it's small enough, right? So this means that in this nice regions like the ballistic re thing for tensor PCA, you could think like you are in finite dimension, right? That's what it says. If the learning rate is small, which is, which is what we had before. Okay. Now, more interestingly, more surprising, when the learning rate follows a certain critical scaling, so larger scaling, then you have additional correction terms. It's no longer the population, the, the, the flow is not, the classical theory does not apply. You don't see the, the gradient flow of the population loss. You see one more term. The learning rate is your delta. It's delta, yeah. So that's interesting. So what do I mean by critical scaling? What we see is that there is a, an interval of deltas for which the, uh, the classical picture is true. And the edge of this, what other people in the field call the edge of stability, then at the edge, the system is different. And when you're above the edge, nothing converges. The system is completely unstable. And there is a big advantage at working at the edge. And that's what people do. That is working with the largest possible step size you can afford. If you go too large a step size, your system will be unstable. Uh, but if you take a critical step size, you may win because of this correction term, this additional correction term. This additional correction term is exactly why people want to do SGD and not Langevin and not gradient descent, etc. And the reason is that this term, basically it's because the you know, Langevin dynamics are reversible dynamics. Gradient flow is a limit of Langevin. This one is intrinsically not reversible, and you see this difference just there. But when you talk to, uh, to people who really do that, they tell you, no, 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 stochastic gradient descent works better. And that's the only difference we've, we've found, in fact, between this thing. When you are below this thing, it works the same. Okay, so let's continue. So here, the phase portrait, what you see is deviates significantly from the population gradient flow, the, the classical theory. Yes? Using the noise in the Langevin dynamic would not no. be the same uh, type of... Uh... No, no. You re it's really not a question of size of the noise, it's a question of non-reversibility. Right? So that's something as mathematical physicists we don't like. We like reversible things. For optimization, it's not a good idea. Okay. Now let's, let's look more precisely. When you look at small neighborhood of the fixed point of this equation, which is, uh, you know, the, yeah? So you can use only non-reversible systems? You can use mean field even if you have? No, this is, it's not a question of mean field or not. It's just here, I don't, I don't, I don't care that it's reversible or not. I start with this. 
But I'm, what I'm saying is just philosophical. The reason you have this extra term and you don't have it in Langevin or gradient flow is precisely because this thing is intrinsically non-reversible. So maybe there are other ways to do non-reversible, by the way, if you want, one wants to be creative, there might be other ways to do non-reversible dynamics that would be smart. And I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm just saying it's open. Okay. So when you rescale near the bad points, near the sticky region, near the places that you want to avoid because that's where your system is slow, if you look at this more precisely, you rescale, you, you obtain di diffusive dynamics which are really interesting and complicated, which are hypoelliptic and which are not, not I mean, they're terrible, which of course I like. So rescaled effective dynamics. So if you look at the, these dynamics in microscopic neighborhood of the bad places, then you have those diffusive limits. And this rescaled effective dynamics become diffusive, as I said. And of course, it's this kind of degenerate diffusion limits which rule how much time you will take to escape the bad regions. Okay, so let me give you, so that's kind of a global picture, which I say in words. Of course, you have plenty of theorems for that. Let me give you an example. Let's take matrix and tensor PCA, which we had already explained. So plenty of literature. The, the complexity has been done, as I said, in this work with uh, Andrea Montanari, Song Mei, and Mikhail Nika. And you have a lot of optimization results by Florent Lenka and their collaborators and Reza Okosh and myself. Okay, so you know the story here. I miss, I'm sorry, th there should be a tensor. This is U tensor, okay. And so we do the, uh, L, the uh, MLE here, just to change a bit. I, I didn't assume, I didn't restrict this to be on the sphere. So it's an RN. So if I'm not on the sphere here, I have two summary statistics, the latitude and also the distance to the sphere, x minus mu squared. So here, I'm not working on the sphere, but essentially on a thickened sphere, essentially, but I'm still in RN. Then you can solve everything. You can do the whole story and I, I won't go back because I've already explained this directly. So when the step size is critical, what you find is interesting dynamics, which with many more fixed points. And um, so, and you find what I explained before. If you start randomly, you start in a microscopic neighborhood of an uninformative fixed point, zero essentially, for the latitude, and where the effective dynamics become diffusive, and then you have a sharp transition, depending on, between a, an Einstein Uhlenbeck, a stable Einstein Uhlenbeck, and an unstable Einstein Uhlenbeck process. So, stable Einstein Uhlenbeck means it's like a Brownian motion in a harmonic well, so it's stable. The other one is with the negative sign, so it just goes to infinity. So, which one do you like, by the way? Which one do, should we like, stable or unstable? What is good news, stable or unstable? Hmm? It's unstable. Right? Because you are close to the bad point, you want to escape. That's hell. So unstable is good, right? Because then it moves you away. Okay, so let me give you a new example, which I mentioned before, but that I will now take a little more detail. So the XOR classification of a Gaussian mixture. As I said, this is a problem that created the, what is called the second winter of uh, AI. Because this problem, so let me first describe the problem. So this problem, this XOR problem, so we took it exactly like it's taught in computer science type things. It's the canonical example of a decision boundary problem requiring at least two layers. Why did this create problems in the 90s? Is that up to then, everybody was using one layer things like the perceptron, things coming from the physics side. And this problem is not solvable with one layer, you need two. Okay? And that's why this thing was stuck until somebody th said, oh, why don't we use two layers? And then this started the multi-layer industry of machine learning. So let's go to, for this problem. Let me explain what that is. 
So it, what you said before that with one layer, provided you have uh, something large enough, you can uh, represent any function. Yeah, that's true. But uh, but then again, it's uh, it's to, to have to, to have it huge. So here is the problem: the data is given by an IID sample, but my my IID sample now is here. You have a number which is just Bernoulli one half, right? So plus or minus one or zero one, depending how you choose Bernoulli. So this is just a label. It's your your point is red or blue. And then this Xi is a Gaussian mixture. And in the blue case, it's a ga oops. In the blue case, it's a Gaussian mixture of these two bumps. In the red case, it's a Gaussian mixture of that two bumps. Okay? So that's the X or, if you know exclusive or in logic. So here I explain that a little more. When Y is one, so let's say when it's blue. It's a mixture of Gaussians, and here I, sim I take a very simple situation where I have the same covariance, just isotropic identity. Lambda is, of course, a signal-to-noise ratio. One over lambda is a variance. And so when Y is 1, when it's blue, it's a mixture of a Gaussian, half-half mixture of a Gaussian at mu and negative mu. So if you do a picture, XOR you have... Let's say mu is this center of mass. Here you have a Gaussian around this, or negative mu. So the blue things are mixture of these two Gaussians. The red things, so when y is 0, it's a mixture of the same thing, but with a different mu. Right? So let's say nu is here or here. Okay? So if it's blue, it's here. If it's red, it's here. Okay? The Gaussians are, are, are the same. I mean, you don't look for the variance. No, no, the variance is fixed. Of course, you could complicate matters, but I don't. Okay, so the variance are just isotropic. The only parameter here is the, the, the variance of this, this one over lambda, or lambda, the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, so you have your data, you have a certain amount of number of points drawn from this thing. You have the, this one is supervised, right? That is, you know which class it is, right? So you, you, we tell you this is blue, this is red. Okay. And you want to do a classification. You want to be able to classify. So classification you do using a two-layer network and the cross-entropy loss and the ReLU activation function. So that's this function. So what does that mean? Let me, let me draw a picture again of a... So you have two layers. Here you have the W. That's the, the weights of the first layer. You have your data which is coming in here, x. So wx gives you what's coming on out of the first layer. Then you apply the relu function, g is relu. You, you apply it individually. This g of a vector means you apply it to each coordinate. Okay, so that gives you something coming out. Then you have another weights, series of weights, which are V, which is now a vector. You take the inner product. Okay. This gives you a number. Then you apply the uh, sigma, which is your last activation. And then this gives you an output, which I call Y hat. Okay. This is this formula. And then you take the cross entropy loss to measure the quality of approximation from this output to what you want to have. Okay? So sigma is the sigmoid and g is the relu. So sigma is, as I said before, the sigmoid. So we didn't choose that on purpose, which is exactly the problem as it is supposed to be done. 
And the, the, the thing we have here, I'm sorry, this is it's not one point here. The, the, the second layer here has k nodes. And we know that, so here you have k nodes. And we know that the, uh, so v is, is a k by whatever. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This, I'm sorry, this is one, this is k. And k has to be larger than four. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. So in the end, if you don't want to understand this whole story, we have a loss function, which is this. Just believe me, you do the cross entropy loss of this mess, and that's what you find. Here, this term I didn't explain before, that's a regularization term, right? As always, when you have, this is really the loss function. This is a regularization term. The large, this is, of course, a term that is, if you want to minimize this thing, that's a term that makes your V and W not be too large, as always, when you have optimization. I, I could, you know, before I could also work on a sphere, that would be the same thing, but here you just add this term to make sure that V and W are not too big. So that's really the thing, that's a loss function. I would have, so we just took that and look at it. Okay. If you look at the law of this loss function in the particular case we're here, in fact, it depends on 22 parameters when k is 4. When k is 4, there are in fact 22 parameters. You can look at it and that's what you find. So then it's natural to try the idea that these 22 parameters might be a summary statistic. Right? Okay, of course here we are using this, the fact that we are informed. It's an academic problem. We know the, the loss function, we, we can compute, in fact, the true population loss here, okay? And this true population loss will essentially depend on 22 parameters. In fact, we can try these 22 parameters are being natural summary statistics. In fact, when you do that, you realize that you don't need the 22. Eight of them are essentially useless. So in fact, 14 are enough. Yeah? I'm sorry? This 22 is specific to the... To this model, of course, and to k equal 4. If you take k equal 6, it's even bigger. Sure. But, uh, yeah. So k is the structure of the... Yeah. The, of the network, but also to the data distribution. Yes, definitely. Of course, of course, of course. So, all right. And what do you find? Then you have summary statistics, you have effective dynamics, and they are fantastically interesting. Instead of having like uh, tensor PCA one region, which was near zero, here you have 39 bad regions, right? Fixed point regions, regions which are slow, which are varying topological dimension. They are not all the, are not, they are not necessarily a point or a line, they, they have all sorts of different dimension. All that is classified of which 24 are stable. So stable is good or bad? Bad, right? You want, I mean, one is I mean, the true minimum, the place where you want to go, that should be stable. But all the others, when they're stable, it's bad for you because your algorithm comes to a stable place and you don't want to be there, right? Okay, so I, of course I cannot draw this picture. In fact, we did draw pictures, but I'm, I don't even know how to put them in the, in the presentation. But you have them in the paper. So, surprisingly now, if you start randomly, as I said before, so you start your, your system randomly. So you start your weights, your Ws and Vs, let's say with a Gaussian distribution, because you don't know what to do, right? You start randomly. Then, so you, then you project in this 22 dimension, in fact, 14. Now you, you start, so you have this projected system, and in fact, your random thing will, be, will not be concentrated like before at the equator in one place. It will be concentrated in many of those things. And the question is, will you escape this region to a good classifier, to the place where, which is the glo global minimum? So the algorithm will converge to a classifier with a macroscopic generalization error, which means something which is not a minimizer, a bad thing, with probability 29 out of 32. 
Okay, so we are extremely proud of this 29 out of 32. Of course, when, so when k is 4. And then once you reach one of those bad places, the bad classifier, then there you would follow a very degenerate diffusion. You're in dimension 14, but it will be a diffusion in dimension 1, and it's pretty hard to escape. So the algorithm fails. Right? That's what it means. So the algorithm fails with probability, I mean, succeeds with probability 3 out of 32. Again, when you do probability, this never happens, except when you do probability for 101. Right? But normally it's 1 or it's 0. Okay, so is this good news or bad news? What? <laughs> for, for, for you, the minimizer, the, one who, the guy who wants to solve the problem, to find the, the, tr the, the something with a, a, a small generalization error. It's bad, right? No, in fact, it's good. No? Because if you're Google, you just employ 100 interns, each of them runs this thing. If three of them out of 32, so, right? So, so if, if even one of them succeeds, then you're done. Because the goal here is not that it works every time. When you train a neural net, you just want that it works once. Once it has worked, you keep your train weights and you forget everything else, all the junk, right? It doesn't mean that you have to learn every time. If you've learned once, then you know. Did you assume that you can detect uh, whether you have landed on a bad classifier? Yeah, of course. Here in this context, yes. That's, a, that's, a, that's why it's called supervised. That is, you, if, it's, if, if you, you, know, you have your, what they do usually is they, they have a, a amount of data, they cut it in two, they use half of it to train, and then they test, they do what is called the test error. The, you all have trained your network, I, keep, I take your results, your weights, and I test it on the rest, and if one of them works well, that's it. I can draw, every, I can put everything else to the junk. So, that's okay in that problem, but that doesn't smell so good if you scale everything. No, this you can scale as much as you want. So it's not a. Pr this does not depend on n. This depends on k only. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you get k large, it becomes much easier. That's what I'll say. So the probability of good classification is three of thirty-two, and so this probability, of course, is an important thing. But of course, you could improve it. As that's what you're saying. If you scale k, if the last layer, if you do what is called overparameterization. You need only four, but you do 100. Then this probability of classification goes to one, and it goes exponentially fast. Right? So it's better to have a large K. Of course, there's a balance. The larger your K, the heavier it is to run your algorithm. Right? Because when you enlarge your K, the system, the dimension of your dynamical system increases. Right? So there, and of course, the dimension of my uh, summary statistics, the projection, is now also increases with k. Right? It's finite, but it's inc it increases with k. Okay. Is there a level of parameterization? What? Uh, is there a level of parameterization when it goes bad? I mean... Of overparameterization? No. When what happens when k becomes large, this probability of success is 1, tends to 1, very fast. The only thing is, as I said, the, the balance here is then when k is large, running the algorithm is more complicated. You need more resources. At some point, between overparameterization over makes the problem simpler, uh, but of course, heavier. Okay. What distinguish uh, the, the bad region from the, the good one, let's say? A big, uh, oh, that, that's a long story. But so you have all these uh, critical regions. And so you have a good one where you have the minimum of your thing. The others are, some of them are, uh, so they have various dimensions, as I said, and some of them are very stable. Once you get close to them, it's very hard to escape. Some of them are easy. 
So, in fact, when you start, if you, you essentially in this thing, it's you had a probability three of thirty out of thirty-two to start in a good region, where escaping is fast and you go to the minimum, and you had a probability twenty-nine of thirty-two to go to start, in fact, randomly to start from one of the bad regions, where you will escape, but in much longer time scales. Okay, that's the thing. And of course, if you give enough time to the system, even if you start in a bad region, it will at some point find the true minimum, but it will take much more time, which means here much more data. Okay, so let me... Oui, yes. This is uh, 2932, so it's whatever you want to do, so it's generic of a... Uh, here, yeah, so there's also, no, in fact, you're right. Here we did the case where, I mean, we, you can treat everyone, but this one, what, 2932, is when they are orthogonal. So the way it depends also on the uh, Of course, if you have the two like that, yeah, yeah, you're right, I should have said that. Okay, so let me not do that. So here we also did, XOR is complicated, you could do the same thing. You could take a binary Gaussian mixture, just two, not XOR. And as I said, if you just do two with the usual classification task, it's a, it's a single index model, right? But you could say, you know, again, the architecture is up to you. The task is given to you. What you want to do is classify Gaussian mixtures, but maybe you want to classify Gaussian mixtures with two layers, right? So you can do the same thing and you see the same kind of story. Uh, here, the three out of 32 becomes a half and the whole story is similar. It's a little less complicated than the XOR case. And that's a good case to start because it's much simpler than the analysis of the XOR, which is really serious. Yeah. The, the more layer, the more bad the classifier you generate? Uh, that's an interesting question. That, that you have to wait for the next thing. I don't know. The answer is I don't know. But uh, I, I know a bit. So now that I've told you what we can do with all this story and blah, blah about it, let's go into explaining things. So what are summary statistics? So again, I have my, my SGD with step size delta, random initialization. And so I look at a, a function that I would call u, smooth from RP, or, which is my p is for parameter. It was, this is what I've called n up to now. p is very large, to RK. So this is 10 to the 9. This is 17. So that's my projection. I call u1, uk, the coordinates. And and I, and I want to apply this to my dynamics, okay? And I want to say that this dynamics, this projected thing, will be roughly autonomous, okay? That's what I explained in our summary statistics. So I will need some assumptions between the step size scale and the loss gradient, etc. So remember, I called phi the population loss, which is the expectation there's no n here of the loss. H was a centered loss. So H is a random function. And I call K the gradient of this random function. It's a random smooth function. And I call V the covariance matrix of the gradient. Okay, so I have this random function, which is my loss centered. I look at its gradient and I look at the covariance of the gradient. And this depends on the point, of course. At every point, you have a different structure of covariance. Wait a minute, I missed something. Oh no, it will come later, okay. So we say that a triple, so I have my loss function, my unknown distribution P and my projection U, we say that it's delta localizable if there is an exhaustion by compact sets with these properties. Okay, boom, that's, you know, that's why math is easy. You just put the assumptions you need for your theorem. All right, so, you know, let's look at what they are. They are like, okay, forget all this, this is a local thing. So you, you want the derivative of your functions to be up to order two and three to be bounded, which of course, if you assume that you have the choice of your delta, this gives you a bound on delta, right? This is delta to a negative power, should be larger than something. So this tells you delta should be smaller than something. Okay, so your step size should be smaller than something, which is obtained from those derivatives. 
Here you assume that your loss function is well behaved. That's not much. You assume that the gradient is locally bounded, that the cube power of the, of the gradient of h is also, of course, which is a random thing. That's why you have to take the expectation and also locally bounded with something depending on delta. So again, this thing tells you, since you have a negative power, this tells you delta should be smaller than something. Same story here and same story here. So, of course, you, the first thing is you see that and you say, is there any example that falls in that? So, don't worry, all the examples I mentioned satisfy that. So, can you remind us what is u? u is the projection. u is the function. I have a function from the large space, 10 to the 9 dimension, to 17. That's my projection. That's the thing I would like the god of statistics to give me, right? In simple example, like the one I've treated, that's the one I guessed, right? And that's the one that the BBP transition will give me Friday. Okay, but for the moment, the god of statistics gives you this, this projection. This projection has to satisfy a certain number of things. And as you've seen, this, all this number of things is essentially saying, for any u, I will, you know, reasonable u, I will just, if I choose delta small enough, all that will be satisfied. So, so okay. you could be a classifying function on your data? So you, as I said, it's this thing which really contains the information of in which direction you have the most action. Oh, no, okay. Right? Like so, so it could be something you want to follow, it could be something that the system imposes on you. Right? It could be the loss function. Right? In fact, it will be typically the projection on the on the uh, the, eig the projection on the eigenvectors of the top eigenvalue. We'll exp but for the moment, I'm just saying there is a u. For a u, I choose a delta small enough, and I call this then a good thing, a localizing sequence. Okay. Then I, I look at the following. I look at j, the Jacobian of u, the projection, which are the summary statistics, and I look at these two differential operators. So that's the one defined by the population loss. This L is a second order thing which is defined by V, and you all remember that V is the covariance of the gradient of the, of the centered loss. Okay? So I have a second order operator and a first order operator. Okay? Now I look, here comes the theorem. I take my SGD. And I assume that u is delta localizable and theorem. And so I, I, uh, so I, I call u of t, uh, so because of course my uh, SGD is in discrete time, so now I, I make it as a, a continuous time on the time step delta. I start from un. I assume of course that the initial, when I take the initial uh, condition, when I project it, it converges to something. That's all I need to do. Then, this, then, then the result is very simple. It's a homogenization type result. My projection converges to something, and the something is the solution of an SD. Okay? Of course, I didn't tell you H is and who sigma is. I didn't have a Brownian motion in my story. Remember, it was an SGD. There was no Brownian, no noise. Okay? So that's the result. If I have those blah, blah, blah condition, then this projection will essentially be asymptotically homogeneous. I mean, uh, autonomous. And it will satisfy a natural thing. Okay, so that's the dynamical system that will contain the information. So in the case of tensor PCA, what did we get? We had nothing like this. The sigma was zero, right? Because we had. In the case of tensor PCA, we had just had a differential equation. This u was just the project; it was just the latitude along the trajectory, and it satisfied a simple, very, a very simple differential equations. Okay. So, again, the summary statistics we have in mind are all sorts of things, and this is what we'll talk later. But, okay, let me forget all this. I discussed the assumptions, but there is no point here. So in order to, dis to, to, to see the link between that and the classical theory of SGD, let's, 
assume that each of the two terms, A and L, individually admit a limit. Right? Here, remember, I assumed... Okay. Oh, this is too slow. So here is A and here is L. So if I assume... Ah, here. That this A of U, that's the important assumption to have this autonomous thing, that it converts to a certain F of U. And that this L of U, normalized by delta, my time step converges to a G of U. That's what makes the assumptions, the, the limiting things, autonomous. Then in this case, what I call H, which was the drift of my limiting object, my summary statistics, is simply this F plus this G, or minus F plus G. So we call F the population drift, G is the population corrector, and sigma is the diffusion matrix. In most cases, we will find that the population corrector, G, is zero, and that the diffusion matrix is zero. So in, more, in, in simple cases, we will find, oh God, I put it too far. So, okay, I know what to do. I will write it here. So the limiting equation we have, oops, is dut equals h of ut dt plus sigma, square root of sigma of ut dwt dbt. Right, and this H will be minus F plus G. Right, and F is the, the uh, population drift, this is the population corrector, and sigma is the diffusion matrix. In most cases, we will find that G is zero, and we will find that sigma is zero, so we'll have an ordinary differential equation, and when G is zero, this would correspond exactly to the classical thing, to the... the the gradient flow of the, of the population loss. But there are cases and regions and whatever where g is non-zero and when sigma is non-zero, as we'll see. Okay. The fixed dimensional perspective, when you are the classical theory, gives you that, as I just explained. So the classical theory corresponds to the case where g is zero and sigma is zero. Okay. So that's what I'm just saying here. Because your U has still reduced enormously the dimension, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying in the if you were in the situation where, of course, this F is not really the, the great. In the let's imagine that your your dimension does not diverge, but that your amount of data is enormous. Then, under the proper assumption, it's not true either in this case that the projection would be autonomous. But when the projection is autonomous, it would converge to that. Okay, so the picture of the classical case would be G is zero, the corrector is zero, and the diffusion term is zero. Okay, so that's what I'm saying here. The, 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 the classical perspective applies in this high dimensional case only when the population corrector G is zero and the diffusion matrix is zero. Okay, so now let me go to something else, critical scaling. So, this is important, the subcritical scaling regime. First, we find that if I give you a U, an L, and P, there is a, a, a scaling of the learning rate, delta, such that when, you are, when delta is less than delta N, there is a critical delta N. Right? There is a delta, if delta is less than this delta N, which is critical, let's say, then, Indeed, you have g equals zero and sigma equals zero. So, in fact, what we can prove is the following. If I give you this system and I give you a delta n for which you have a limit, as soon as you take a, a delta n smaller, neg I mean, negligible compared to that, then you also have a limit. The theorem also works, but necessarily the... for in this smaller regime, the g and the sigma must be zero. Okay? 
So this means you have an interval of deltas for which you have a scaling limit which correspond to the classical case. And that's called a subcritical scaling regime. That's what we call the subcritical. So in the subcritical, the classical perspective works. But then you have the critical scaling where you're just at this value in which g and sigma may be non-zero, where you have this extra term. And then you have extra non-trivial non corrections to the cl classical picture, which is what I called before the edge of stability. So here it is. To, so, to see this, let's assume that this ULP is delta n localizable, if you remember this crazy list of hypotheses. It's easy to see that if it's del localizable and delta prime is smaller than delta, then it's also delta prime n localizable. So if it works for a certain scale of delta, it works for smaller scales of delta. And, and as I said, when it works for this, when delta prime is little o of delta n, then necessarily the g and the sigma are zero. Right? So it just killed this non-trivial effect. So essentially there is one scaling of delta for which g and sigma may be non-zero. And for smaller scales, the fixed dimensional perspective applies. So now let me explain ballistic versus diffusive. Uh, so the, as I said, the ballistic limit is when sigma is zero, but you could have h non-zero, non-equal to f, so g non-zero. So then you have an ODE of that type, and then you have this dynamical system, which is not necessarily the gradient flow of the population loss. That's what you have to follow. In the example I gave you for, with this 22 direction, that's what we have in, in most of, of the places. Okay, so that's the important thing. The time scales of order one over delta n, right? Because remember, the, the, the time step was delta n, so that's uh, okay. Oh, that's what I just said. So now, when you are so uh, when you are close to one of those sticky points, then you could rescale. That's what I'm saying here. Uh, so how do you do that? You rescale. Let's say that your system is coming close to a point. Let's say u star, which is slow, right? where your dynamical system is stuck. Then you rescale, like that. So u star is a fixed point of this ballistic limit. If you rescale, then in most cases we have here this rescale thing. Oops. Again, you have to work with the theorem. And then you see that this rescale thing converges to a new thing. Right? So in this much smaller scale, so let's say near the equator, you understand how you escape. That's, and you can develop that in all these stories. So this is done in the three classes of examples I gave you. Tensor PCA or XOR or Gaussian mixtures. And then you may obtain rescaled effective dynamics of this form. The tilde means I have rescaled. So that's locally. And then you can have a diffusion term. But so this looks like diffusion approximation to SGD, but it's not because in fact, there are very, two very important differences. First, that the, um, it's really the, you know, in the neighborhood of a fixed point of this effective, of this projected thing, not the whole population dynamics. And more importantly, that the SGD, the, the diffusion limits we obtain, the sigma, are typically degenerate. They are, for, for whatever reason, they are, in all the examples, we don't have a theorem saying that, but in all the examples we've tried, they are hypoelliptic. So again, when you, know, when you have a degenerate, imagine what that means. You're trying to understand how you escape a region. Let's say it's a little line here. And near this, your system converges to a diffusion which is very degenerate. Right? You're in dimension 17, but it has diffusion only in, the, in two directions. Then the time it takes to escape is much longer, typically. That's why this thing will be very sticky. And when you want to understand how much time it takes to escape, which means here how much data you need, because each step needs one more point, data point. This depends on this structure very much. Right? So this is mysterious and interesting. 
Of course, we could solve that in the examples in general. It's even though uh, hypoelliptic diffusion, or I, I, I like them, but they, you know, they are sometimes difficult to manage. Okay, and I will stop there. Okay, for this thing. All right. So, of course, if you want more, I can continue. <laughs> yeah, questions. Yeah. So you mentioned that on the critical region, you yeah. may have like a population correction term and a yeah. diffusion uh, yeah. matrix. Do we know like when this happens? In which case, even in the like the no critical. No, I, no. So first, what we know is the other, th which is when it's not critical, it doesn't happen. But when it's critical, in the examples we have, for instance, when we have these 39 different regions, in some it happens and in some it doesn't. So, uh, honestly, I cannot answer that. This is really a geometry question, which, which I don't So, see. even for the same problem for different like, critical points, you yes. have different... Yes, so you have, and you don't have at all the same structure. Some points are much slower than others. For instance, in this question of uh, XOR, you have some regions that are, I say, with probability 3 out of 32, it succeeds, which means with probability 3 out of 32, you, you find you start in a region where you go fast. Now, lo let's look at the 29 of the 32, the other regions. They are not all the same. For some, you would need that much data. For the, some, you would need that much more data or time to get there. Right? So, in the, in the way I've phrased the problem here, I just don't care. Because I said I want to have a fixed amount of data, which means I want to, f to work in M steps. And that's it. But, but in fact, now if I ask the question, how much more data would I need? Then, depending on where I start, uh, the local system would be different. This G and sigma would be different, and things would be different. Right? The, the um, important thing, of course, is that you don't, you don't have a signature of the fact that you have. If I just tell you like this, you don't have a signature that your system has worked or not. The only way to do is what we said before here, that is, you do your thing, you program, you give me uh, your, let's say, W and V, your training parameters, and then I try them on the second part of my sample, which I didn't use to train. And, and that's it. But I, because a priori, I don't know which region is good and which is not good. Right? That's a so it almost feels like it's better to like, do multiple initializations rather than let the algorithm work for a long time? Yeah. That's a, that's a, uh, that's what I'm saying here. For this context, yes, that's, uh, you, you start at random, you pull at random, uh, and then you just... Uh, because, of course, in the algorithm as I do it here, there is no noise at all, right? So the only noise is, of course, there is the randomness of the, of the landscape, but the only noise is my initial point. Right? So it's better, indeed, to, to do more uh, initialization when you don't know, like that. Okay, so yes. in the uh, single index uh, example that you gave before, can, can you have a complex picture with several critical points, or is there only one? Uh... No, in fact, you have. That's what I explained br briefly. Yeah. So here's. So the. Okay, I didn't spend time on that, but let's go back to the case of the tensor PCA type thing, right? So, and again on the sphere, not on this softened sphere, because I can draw. So again, you have the sphere, which as I said, is a bad picture. Here is the absolute, the global minimum that you want to find, and you start at random, you start here, right? So in a little, you start at random, which means you start at the equator with a, a tiny width. That's the typical thing. So in fact, when you look at the, the critical points and all that type of things, as I said, on the equator, this is essentially a spin glass, a spherical spin glass, because this term is essentially zero. So here you have a very serious exponential complexity. You have exponentially many critical points, exponentially many local minima, and plenty of local minima that are very close to the absolute minimum. At here, not this one, right? So the but now when you incre when you increase your so that's uh, so that's for a given lambda when you inc you increase your lambda so this picture is understood from this work with Montanari and May and, and Nika initially all the even when you have a positive lambda that explains the IT threshold all the local what 
lambda is the signal to noise ratio. Even when you have a signal, there is a regime of lambda which, when, which are too small and all the critical points are at the equator. Which means that even if you could find, so the global minimum is near the equator. So even if you could find the global minimum easily, it will not be correlated to the signal, right? Then there is a value above which you see a little band appearing here at a certain latitude where you have critical points. But the number of critical points you have here is not exponentially large, right? The, in the exp it's the limit of 1 over n log of this number goes to 0. So it could be polynomial, right? But it's not exponential. Here you have exponentially many. Here you have not exponentially many, right? When your lambda increases then, so here, and of course now, there is even a moment where you have exponentially many, uh, not exponentially, you have critical points here, but your global minimum is still here. Right? The system is really pervert. I mean, they don't want you to succeed. Then there is a moment where the global minimum is here. So that's good, because if you find the global minimum, then you're correlated with the truth. Right? Your, your distance to the truth is less than random. And then there is a moment, so when you increase lambda, so this thing will come close to, the more lambda is large, the larger lambda, the the closer to the North Pole. And there's a moment where you have a phenomenon, so that was proven with uh, uh, Alfinger and Lee and myself. There's a moment where you have what is called topological trivialization, which means that in this thing, you don't have many critical points, you have only one, and that's the absolute minimum, right? So, and, and, and nothing else here. So this means that in this hemisphere, when you are in this regime, in this hemisphere, right, the, the landscape is trivial, right? You have only one global minimum, and so once you enter here, then the last phase is very simple. It's a convex optimization thing. You just go down. And, uh, and then, of course, when the... So, but the, the, um, so the difficulty is that w escape, when you escape... In order to escape mediocrity, as I said before, to beat entropy here, you need lambda to be super large. So in this regime, you will be indeed in the case where you have this thing. But now, so indeed when you start from random, you need so much strength of the signal to, or, or to escape entropy that once you find the good region, then the last phase is just nothing. Okay? But imagine that, so what you're asking here, imagine that you start in a hot phase. That is, somebody tells you, here's the hemisphere. So you start here. Right? Already, you, ha you have some prior, an information saying that's where you should lack. Then in this regime, you could very well have this thing here. So this has a certain width. I, I drew it too small. The true minimum is somewhere in the middle of this thing. But if you start at random here, so you will go down. Here you don't have to beat the entropy because you're already in the hemisphere, and you will come here, and here you may very well fall in one of those multiple uh, local minima that you have there. Right? You don't have an exponential number of them, but you have polynomial, and you will probably not find, in fact, you can prove that you will not find the true minimum. Right? You will find something which is, with a value which is, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, higher than the true minimum, but it's it's so you 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 won't find the true minimum, but still what you find here is positively correlated with the truth, right? Who cares about really finding this true minimum here? Because in fact, what you want to find is this. But if you apply your point of view of summary statistics to that case, you say yeah. that in some regimes you can approximate that by one dimensional. Yeah, that's exactly the thing. The summary statistics in this case is one dimensional. And this is, and precisely, it's a case where your uh, uh, projection, the dynamical system, will have two sticky places. Z so in this direction, you will have zero here and some altitude r or whatever here. So you have two sticky places. That's what I'm describing. You would have zero. That's where you start, and you have another one, which is not yet where you want to be, which is one, where you also have a, a sticky thing. 
Pourquoi on est passé au français I don't know. This is an interesting question. I don't know. But in fact, what we are happy with is that there are these extra terms, not only because they are the ones that allow you to escape certain minima, but also a certain slow region, but also because that's what uh, was, you know, when I discussed 10 years ago with oh, yeah, Jan, they, 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 he told me, or Leon Botou, he told me, as a, a gradient descent or, doesn't work. So, no, I, why? I, no, so. I, I think I've understood from your, your, your yeah. class today why. Uh, Using the noise of Y is a good idea. Yeah. But I was just wondering whether by the critical delta. You no, you're right. It sounds. It sounds. Re- it's like you could detect how big is the variance of. The but it's. It's of course. It cannot be exactly what you're saying because there's on top of that there is Y. But it's, it's the same spirit. But there. But there's also the, this projection. There's U. So this. So it's a geometric thing, which is built from the noise of Y and the projection. Of course, you know, to have summary statistics, it's easy. Take u equals zero. What I'm saying here is not, you, know, you could study stupid things like the projection to zero. That's okay, that's, uh, then it's not hard. Uh, but the, and then of course your delta n is whatever. So of course what we are saying here that we want summary statistics which are informative. Yeah. So in the examples we had, they were because they described, in the example of XOR for instance, we described completely the distribution of the system with these things. And, and so in, when we discuss BBP, we will, we will have the hope that they do describe the, the important things. But, uh, but, but I don't know. And, and so this, this, the definition of this critical value depends on you too, right, on the projection. Yeah. And that I don't know. Maybe, maybe you'll answer tomorrow, but a small other question. If I take a, a monster real system like a translation model, huh? where you train your, your network to translate from a language to another, Is there a way by your spectral analysis to capture the, the lower dimensional model that encode the... That's what I hope. The, the, yeah, sure, that's what I hope, of course. That's the, 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 but the, the um, you know, you, one should look at... And that is harder for me because when, I would do that only with models that people really use. And that is usually secret. That is the... What is the loss function they use? What is the structure of the network they use? And so on. This is typically what they don't tell you. They translate that and publish that. Yes, they don't publish that. So that's why I take these things, because these things are respected as hard problems, but they are, you have exactly the thing that... But, but you're right. So if there, there, I believe that engineering is the other th- direction. It's you, the network should be built in such a way that a few things are autonomous dynamics and are not stupidly slow. That's exactly, but that, that, architect, that engineering problem, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have access to that, so I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking. Um, you, you, you mentioned that non-reversibility is super important to see the noise emerging. Mm-hmm. Not to see this extra term, not noise. Possibly sigma, but in many cases you don't have sigma. You you have just this corrector term G. Yeah. 
But it's the sigma you were looking for. No, 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 not always. Sometimes it's, it's no, no. Sometimes it's sigma. Sometimes it's in, in many examples of four, even for XOR, we have cases where sigma is zero and this is, it's a G that allows you to live. Okay. Right. So you, you have two terms, possibly a drift, possibly a diffusion term, that may help you leave. Right. The, the bad regions. And and honestly, I. Uh, you know, that's, you see that it comes, and but, but I don't know. You know, if if we had a different type of algorithm, I don't. You would have to redo the work. It's, it's not. We are not at a level where we understand the metaphysics of it. But the G is probably arising from the mixture of the the law of Y and the U projection yeah. you use. So it tells you that if I'm interested in that type of projection. Then the particular law of Y is pushing me. Uh, mm. But again, you, you get it only in this edge of stability. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, so that's why, in fact, people, what they, what they do typically when they, you know, typically when they train for a new problem, they know what to do because they, they are experienced. That's what a good engineer is. Then you don't need all this. But when they don't really know, then they start with very small time steps and they see if it works. If it gets stuck in bad places, that is the general, the error when you do the training, you, 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 you test what you've done on, on your sample. When it doesn't work, then, uh, then maybe they increase. They see what's going on. And, and, um, and at some point it becomes crazy, and at some point maybe some new things begin to appear. That's, uh, that's what I understand. Of course, to try very small de delta, you need to have a lot of data. Right? That's, uh, that's the problem. That's why you know trying this on hard problems is complicated. You need a, you need a lot of power and a lot of data, which that's why we just prove theorems. Okay, there are no more questions. Ah, oh, maybe just yeah, a, yeah, sure. a very quick one. Um, so, according I mean, according to the algorithm you described for stochastic gradient descent, I understand that it's like doing like sampling without replacement of the data you have. No, because you no, the, no. There is something more than that. Yeah, it's true that it's that, but it's something else. Look, we use only one point. Yeah. We don't use the mean, yeah. right? When m is large, you expect that this is the gradient of the empirical loss. You expect that this mean of gradient is close to the gradient of the population loss, the gradient you want to follow. Whereas here, there is no real reason for that, right? So. So that's what uh, Clement was calling the noise of this. Is when you take only one, it's much more noisy. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, you have m, m data points, and then you do only n steps. Yeah. Uh, and so you only use the points only one. Yeah, so that's what I was calling a reuse when I started. So do you know, so, I mean, to me, it looks like if we were to do, like, multiple times n step, yeah. we would do multiple times, like, sampling uh, without replacement of the data set, and once we've finished anything in the data set, we can pick it again. And is there anything like we know when we're doing sampling with replacements, meaning that we just have a data set and we sample one point? Yeah, so, okay, so first, there's a lot of practice of these things and very few results. The, the result on reuse on very simple models, rank one, I mean, single, single index is three weeks old, right? So that's by Florent, Florent Jacala, Lenkaj de Borova. And yes, yes, I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry to. For, uh, that's the terrible thing to just remember the old guys. Uh, so say that again. Yeah, yeah. And so, and that's a beautiful. That's a beautiful. That's not. <laughs> not here. I hope. That, that, okay, good. Uh, so okay, erase that from the movie. That's a, so so. Um, so yeah, the, the result is very interesting because it proved that, that indeed just a, a, a very few reuse works, it helps a lot, right? So then there is a lot to understand. But when, when I discussed that a long time ago, more than 10 years ago with uh, Leon Boutou and uh, with Yann Kahn and these type of people, I understood that what they do typically when the system is hard and they, don't, they cannot multiply their amount of data that much, they do a lot of reuses. So first, they use. They don't use first. They don't use a, um, a, a mini batch of size one. They do use a mini batch of a small size, but not one. The proper choice of the mini batch size, I really don't know. 
yeah, but that's, there is math to be done there. Or please do. I don't know. But then there is the then there is the question of reuse. So they do reuse by uh, they do quite a few reuse, not just one or twice, and and they do it by using a, a random by randomly permuting. So randomly permuting or picking with replacement is not that difficult. Different in the end, if I understand practically. The of course mathematically to understand this much harder, because the your here what you're using is that each step is independent. If you reuse, then maybe not. So why do they use a random permutation? Is because of course on the random symmetric on the symmetric group, right? Things I mean. Choosing uh, random things are very, very ergodic. I mean, it's, uh, so every time you, you use a random thing, you kind of add a lot of uh, D uh, correlation. But a priori, they are correlated. You introduce another form of uh, random thing, which is the random choice of this thing. If you do reuse by just doing it periodically, uh, then and you don't use this random permutation, uh, at some point you will feel the fact that you're constantly using the same data. Right? And that, uh, but that is too hard at this point. I, don't, I've, I cannot answer that. That's, these are all that. All these are open questions, and everybody is welcome. This this field is open, but th these are hard. These are hard things. That's why you have to study. When you want to study hard things like reuse, you have to study simple models. That's what the, the Lausanne team did. Thanks again, uh, Gérard.